the Health and Safety Committee meeting November, uh, November, wow. wow. September 1st. Wow. What's on your mind? I don't know. I think Thanksgiving, probably. I want pie. I want pie, right. September 1st. And would we, we, I'd like to start with the pledge to the flag. And Mr. Gould, would you please lead us? Sure. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Karen, could you please do roll call? Gould? Here. Amber T. Jackson Callan? Here. Barry is Anderson Parker? Here. Trina is Jackson Ogawa? Here. Forum, we also have Chuck Mayer and Herb Brooks. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, first thing on our agenda this morning is approval of minutes from August 4th. Second. Moved by Collins, second by Gould. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. I just want to clarify do we need to be part of this for a No, we do not. We have four. There you go. Just want to make sure. Four. Four of us. I think everyone else must be taking advantage of the Labor Day um, weekend, upcoming weekend. Next thing on our agenda, we have miscellaneous reports from the Sunny Hill Nursing Home. As always, we're reminded of uh, fun activities that occur there, birthdays, celebrating, um, celebrating anniversaries for uh, our employees and recognizing any new um, employees that have joined us. So hopefully you have the time to read that. In the uh, Sunriser from July, we have uh, lots of nice uh, pictures from Father's Day. So one thing Sunny Hill does is that they have events for the um, residents that include a lot of family members. So Mother's Day, Father's Day, they have Grandparents Day coming up on um, September 10th. And they put together a really nice day event for family to come and just relax and enjoy, enjoy the relatives who are living there. So it's a nice place to go. And if you don't have a relative and you're on this committee and would like to go and attend, you're always able to come and, and see what's going on and join in the festivities. And um, one thing that's very important is the volunteers that go to Sunny Hill. They are the backbone of that place because they're there every day and they do a lot. So anyone who wants to volunteer, you can show up at activity time, which is in the afternoon. You can do fun things. I know Herbie would like to do beading. I know that for sure. Liz, let you miss yesterday they had casino day. So those are always activities that keep our No, you you know, you get to do the beating, you know. And scoop ice cream. And scoop ice cream. So so that's what we have our update from Sunny Hill. Nothing um, new in there. Uh, moving on, we have old business. Uh, is there anyone who would like to discuss any old business? Okay, we don't get any comments on that. Moving on to new business, um, Rita, we have awarding bid for soft goods for Sunny Hill Nursing Home. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, this is for 6th Avenue, which as you all know is the final avenue to be remodeled. This is for the draperies, the bed spreads, the shower curtains, all of the actual soft goods. We released the bid, we got four bids returned, one was a no bid. Um, in reviewing, and if you look at the, the attached documents, in reviewing the actual bids from the vendors, um, Standard Textile from Cincinnati, Ohio, made multiple errors on their bid sheet. Mm. Uh, we listed a quantity, a unit cost, and then they were to extend it out, and I, I, somehow they calculated two when we only wanted one. Somehow they calculated one when we wanted eight. So there were multiple errors. They bid it out at 34,000. It should have only been 22. Hmm. Um, so, but even with their errors, uh, Medallion Services from Creefcourt, Missouri at 17,932 was the low bidder. And this is actually, I believe, the bidder that they used on Fifth Avenue. Oh, so okay. they've worked with them before and they're very happy with their work. So this is, of course, with <coughs> Karen and Becky Alderson's approval. Right, that's great. Okay, I'd like to have a motion. Motion. Second by Trenier, second by Collins. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion to approve. Yep, go ahead. So this is the end. This is the oh, well. Six. Well, no. I mean, it's, we've got 
it's the end of soft goods under this round of remodeling. So how close are we to finishing? I have no idea. This is the last avenue. This is the last avenue. Right, this is the last avenue to be remodeled, but first 14 avenue. Years. Maybe our director back there would have that on hands. Oh, Karen. I there she is. is. She is back. Come on up. She's here. She's way in the back. I know. She's so quiet. It's all about the show. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you take over. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, this is the last avenue that's being done. There's a maintenance package issue. There's some flooring issues that have to be taken care of, of some avenues that we did. 14 years ago. Yeah, it seems like we're under <laughs> But um, yeah, this is basically the major avenue. This is it, of the wow. avenues. So, this said, is so nice. And this has been going on since I got on 14 years ago. Yeah. So well, we had a few closed really for two years. We thought we would do nothing. Right. So yeah, we would mm -hmm. add that into the process. Mm -hmm. So good to hear. It'd be time to start over again. No, no, no please. Okay. No. no. Everything's looking so nice. They're doing such a great job of keeping everything. And I have to say, they are. They are. They really are. There were some, but there's some flooring issues. We have a subfloor issue on First Avenue. There's some water issues going on underneath yeah. the hallway uh, floor, and uh, they get consultants in and things like that. So they're trying to nail that down. But other than that, I mean, yeah, our maintenance department is doing a really good job of keeping up. But, I mean, you could we could paint every day. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. It's just that's and that's what we basically. Right, the rooms, the rooms are tight with two people in them, so. Yes, yeah, they're really beat up with two people. Now, that when we go to private rooms after the first of the year, hopefully we'll see less damage to our furniture and things like the wheelchairs and lifts. So. Right, because the equipment is pretty large. Yeah. Especially when there's two beds in the room. Oh, yeah, so. it's really hard. It's, it's very difficult to get all the equipment that you need for these people that are so sick. Yeah, that's true. So. So we're looking forward to Sixth Avenue being done, and I know the residents. Many are looking forward wow. to a room of their own, yes. where they can have some of their own private items that right. you cannot fit in the room right now. So, and it, it is nice to. I am fortunate that my dad and grandmother are in the same room. So for me, it's kind of like going to their house in a way, because I can just get comfortable, kick off my shoes, and just hang out. Because there isn't a different person in there who's not a family member. So. When they have a room of their own, I'm sure that they will enjoy that. And family members visiting will feel more comfortable, even though Sony Hill is a very comfortable place to, to go. So, all right, thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't remember, Karen, did we do all in favor? Yes, we did. And then Chuck had a question. Thank you. All right, next on our agenda, we have Will County Emergency, ugh, emergency Management. Overview presentation, and here we have Harold Dameron here. He's put together a presentation for us today. Thank you, Harold. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank the, the chairman, first of all. Uh, up, it's been about a month and a half or so ago. Um, she spent uh, a good couple hours with me. I was able to have her captive for a while, and we talked a lot about what we do, what our agency is all about. Um, and even in the space of a couple hours, I couldn't really cover everything. But uh, she was kind enough to uh, have me come here this morning and give you just a little flavor of what our job's all about, what our agency's all about. So I'll try to do that in just a few minutes. Uh, can't possibly cover all the things we do, but um, hope to give you some kind of a flavor of, of some of our uh, activities that, that we uh, accomplish for the county. I do have a PowerPoint that I will use just to sort of keep me from going too far off the rails, but I won't torture you too bad with uh, slides. I'll go through a lot of these pretty quickly. You know, whenever we talk about Will County, we like to talk about all the nice things about Will County, and we all know it's a great place for a lot of things, for business and to live. Uh, but, of course, we can't uh, fool ourselves into thinking that there aren't things that can happen. We've got a history sometimes of uh, emergencies and disasters that have occurred. Uh, we're, not, we're not immune from those types of things. It just goes along with uh, living any place. Uh, so our goal is to try to minimize that for the county. Our goal is to try to deal with those types of hazards and try to uh, make Will County as safe a living place and working place as we can uh, for everybody that's here, that, that lives here and does business here. Just to give you some background on, on how emergency management uh, exists in the state of Illinois and how that ties into us, uh, our, our activities are rooted in the uh, Illinois Emergency Management Act and uh, among the things that that act accomplishes, uh, it requires that each county 
uh, as well as the City of Chicago maintain an emergency management agency and that there's an emergency manager uh, for each of those jurisdictions. So that's fundamentally where we're uh, tied into. This is a, a textbook definition of what emergency management's all about. One thing I've learned in my time as uh, Will County Emergency Management is emergency management means very different things to people. Um, over the years, I've had calls because somebody couldn't pay their utility bill. That's an emergency, and they call the emergency management agency. I have, <laughs> I've had phone calls that they can't bail somebody out of jail. I've, uh, my, my best one is I have somebody call, and they don't call during the day. They usually call us at night. I had, a, I had a call about 8.30 at night. Somebody wanted an emergency duck crossing sign on a road because they were worried about ducks. So when we talk about emergency management, we're talking about the major emergencies. Of course, there's different definitions of emergency management. This is our, our standard, I guess you'd say, that uh, we adopt across the country. And I'm going to touch on some of the words in here in some later slides. But you see those phrases, mitigation, preparedness, response, recovery. You'll see that in just a minute. I'll, I'll revisit that a little bit. Our agency, as I said, we were, were, were rooted in the State Act. Uh, we were originally established in 1959, and, and our name back then was Will County Civil Defense. Uh, sometimes I like to say that we were, we were Homeland Security before Homeland Security was cool. Um, the Homeland Security threat back then was the Cold War and, and the threat of attack from the Russians. Um, but our, our mission just changes as the threats change. Um, we're a small agency compared to most others in the county. We have a small full-time staff, but I especially want to highlight uh, the volunteers we have. We've got about 80 volunteers uh, throughout the agency, and they're, they're integrated in, er in everything we do in the agency. We have some volunteers that come in on a daily basis. We have some that are part of special teams uh, that we operate. So we rely a lot on, on volunteers, especially when the emergencies occur and we need, we need the additional uh, work effort uh, to respond to those. So as I talked about before, with, with our view of emergencies, we're basically dealing with what I call the low probability, high consequence. You know, the day-to-day -day emergencies are just the opposite. The routine medical call, the car accident, the, the police call for service. Those are the things that happen all the time but only affect a few people. We're dealing with the, the other end of that scale. Uh, oftentimes we get involved when we have a lot of organizations coming together, especially those that might not normally work with each other. Uh, all the time. Um, atypical situations, that's my kind of catch-all for the unusual things that nobody knows where else to deal with them at. Sometimes that's where we come into play. We may not be the solution for it, but we usually know where to uh, steer the situation or how to handle it. And I like to say that we specialize in everything. Um, we're, we're sort of jack-of-all-trades um, in terms of having to understand the different hazards that exist, having to work with different players. And again, I'll, I'll highlight some of that in, in a minute. Of course, we deal with lots of different hazards, lots of different threats. Uh, this isn't a complete list, but uh, this gives you a flavor of some of the things we think about that we deal with, that we respond to um, on a routine basis. Of course, natural hazards, um, the technological hazards of what we call things like a accident from transportation or an accident at a chemical facility. We also, of course, are concerned about um, human-caused events, so terrorist attacks, civil disturbances, things of that nature as well. Those things translate into a lot of program areas. Again, this is not a complete list, but a snapshot of at least some of the bigger areas that we're involved in. Fundamentally, our job focuses a lot around planning, training, and exercising, uh, making sure that we're as ready to go as we can be, not just us, but all, of, all the players that are involved. Of course, when an emergency occurs, we respond to those. We help coordinate response. Uh, public education is a big part of what we do. Um, specialized response resources. Responding to emergencies is not our minute-by-minute -minute job, but we do have some special capabilities. Um, and there's other things here listed, and I'll be, I'll be touching back on these in just a minute. Just a little bit about how we operate. Um, as you saw before, we're, we're obviously a fairly small agency. Uh, we're not an agency that's uh, physically staffed around the clock, so to speak, but we're virtually staffed around the clock. We have to operate in a 24-hour uh, posture. So uh, we do that through a couple of mechanisms. We have a duty officer system. Uh, some of the full-time staff rotate uh, on a weekly basis as duty officers. So um, if it's a call that comes in at 2 in the morning, they're the initial 
point of contact through, through magic of some technology. Uh, we have an emergency line that brings to that duty officer, so it's answered live uh, by the duty officer. If the duty officer misses it for some reason, it goes to the next person. So um, sometimes I'm proud of the fact I'll, I'll be talking to a 911 dispatcher who we've worked with over the years, and after some period of time, they figure out that we're not sitting behind a console like they are. They, 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 you know, I'm talking to them, and I'm at my kitchen table, and they're like, we always thought you were in your office all the time. No, we just came up with cool ways to fool you into thinking that. So we, that's how we operate around the clock. And then based on the emergency, we may need to, to respond to it in some fashion or another. Usually our initial response to an emergency might be sending somebody to the scene, what we call an on-scene coordinator, to meet up with the incident commander, the fire chief, the police chief, whoever that is, and help, help them with the uh, emergency. Um, and then we operate everywhere, you know, we're, we're not an agency that just spends our, our entire days behind a desk. Um, certainly that's, uh, some of our work is desk work, but um, we respond to the field all the time. We work with agencies and organizations outside the office, so um, anywhere around the county. And also um, with our neighbors. I'll talk about how we work with our, our neighboring counties, how we work with the state. Uh, so it takes us everywhere. And that's really kind of segues into this. We, uh, we work with just about everybody because you know, we're not the uh, magic agency that can come out and take care of the emergency. We're the agency that tries to bring everybody together. The, the effort is really on the part of a lot of other agencies, local government, special districts, county government, um, <coughs> businesses, uh, of course our citizens, uh, a lot of charitable organizations, relief organizations, the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, things of that nature. Uh, we also work with a lot of special task forces. We, we manage some of those task forces and we're members of other task forces. A couple quick examples. Uh, a few years ago, we organized a, a campus preparedness task force and we brought together all the colleges and universities in the county to help them uh, develop their emergency plans. They are now required by the state to develop disaster plans that are very similar to what we have to do for the county. So we have that group uh, working together. Uh, in partnership with the school's office, we have a K-12 task force as well, uh, and a number of others that we uh, work with. Because a lot of times we deal with emergencies that could overwhelm us, exceed the resources that we have, we often are working on mutual aid arrangements. We have several mutual aid partnerships with neighboring counties, statewide mutual aid partnerships. And then we have kind of a hierarchy of response when it comes to disasters. Uh, there's the phrase that all disasters are local, and that's where the response begins. But when local resources are exceeded, they can come to the county. If we can't meet those needs, then it's going to the state for state assistance. And then finally, to federal assistance if necessary. You all hear about presidential disaster declarations. Uh, Will County has had 17 uh, federal declarations uh, since the early 60s. So believe it or not, we actually average a federal disaster declaration about every four years here in Will County. Um, usually when it's a federal declaration, usually the federal assistance is usually financial assistance. In Illinois, we've got a lot of resources. It's often the, the burden of trying to pay that cost. And you probably hear about that in the news from time to time about federal assistance or sometimes the lack of federal assistance. We've seen some close disasters like Coal City where they had a lot of expense, but it didn't meet the federal criteria. So, so that community ended up having to bear the financial burden because it just didn't reach federal thresholds. You know, before you move yeah. on, maybe I'm just thinking of charitable and relief organizations didn't a while ago, did, I, don't, I don't remember if it was like Exelon or Mobile, that sponsored like a, a training exercise. Do you, do they still do things like that or am I remembering a long time ago? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I can think of what you're thinking of specifically. We do, you know, we work with the business community a lot and a lot of times they do um, conduct training programs that either we're part of, we, we jointly conduct. As a matter of fact, we have something going on right now. Uh, ExxonMobil this week has a, uh, an industrial fire school that's happening. Um, industrial fire brigades from several of the companies are, are training at ExxonMobil this week and it just so happens as we speak right now the morning's segment at the industrial fire school is how they work with us so okay. we've got a couple people out there at ExxonMobil this morning uh, talking about 
how we command incidents, the mobile command center, things of that nature. So I'm not sure if that's what you're thinking of or not, but um, we deal with a host of organizations. The, the typical ones you think of, like the Red Cross and the Salvation Army, they're the big players in disasters oftentimes, but uh, a lot of faith-based organizations <laughs> that exist now. But sponsored this event, but perhaps it's it's yeah, good. I'm sorry, I can't think of it. No, it's probably been for years and years. <laughs> okay. Thanks. You saw these words before, and I'm just going to blast through a few slides just to kind of give you a flavor of these. Everything we do kind of falls into one of these four buckets, and we call it the emergency management cycle. Um, mitigation or prevention, we're trying to minimize the effects of a hazard. Uh, preparing for the things we can't minimize or prevent. Of course, response, and then recovery afterwards. So just very quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a snapshot of these. So mitigation is oftentimes trying to identify the hazards that affect us and how they can affect us, and trying to prevent them from becoming an emergency or minimizing what happens. This is something that really, as I said earlier, this is not just something we do, this is something a lot of people do. Here you can think about things like flood insurance, uh, building codes, uh, floodplain development, uh, things of that nature. Those are things we try to do to minimize the effects of of hazards. Preparedness is something we spend a lot of our time on because of course there are a lot of hazards we can't uh, uh, minimize or eliminate. So a lot of work is spent planning and training and exercising. I mentioned mutual aid a minute ago. This is again just a snapshot of some of the plans and some of the planning areas that we're involved in. Uh, our I guess I'll call it, I always call it the mothership, the, the primary emergency plan that the county has is what we call our all hazards emergency plan. So the plan looks at things that we might have to do during an emergency and whether it's a flood or whether it's a fire, whether it's a chemical spill, a lot of the ways that we respond in terms of warning the public, <coughs> evacuating, sheltering, taking care of the situation, a lot of those things are common across different disasters. Uh, so we, we start our planning on what we call an all hazards basis. But we do have plans for specific events. Uh, and a couple of examples here. We have specific plans for nuclear power plants for Braidwood and for Dresden. We had an emergency there that affects off site. Uh, chemical facilities. Uh, we have plans that are specific to them, and I'll highlight that in, in a moment. Um, special facilities, and that ranges from schools, long term care centers. Uh, uh, those types of facilities, uh, right down to the county's facilities. We, we help uh, maintain the facility emergency plans for the various county buildings in case there's a fire in the building or something of that nature. Uh, resource management is a big part of what we do. We identify resources that are available, who has them, how many, where they're at, how to get them. Uh, that's a continual process. Um, functional needs, we're all familiar with the Americans with Disabilities Act. We have to make sure that everything we do for our disaster is, is in place to accommodate people that have disabilities. So we have uh, a lot of effort uh, to make sure our planning and our preparedness addresses people with functional needs. Continuity of operations, that means how can we as, as government continue to function if we are impacted by a disaster. Debris management, this is a huge area. Uh, this is where a lot of cost comes into play during disasters. So FEMA is putting a lot of emphasis on how are we managing uh, the, the removal of debris and the disposal of debris? Uh, if you remember back to the Plainfield tornado, if anybody was in the area then, you remember we had a lot of burn piles and we just piled up and burned it? Uh, mountains. That's, uh, burn mountains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had, we had six of them. Uh, that doesn't really happen anymore, or it's very limited. We're now subject to a lot of the same things that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. So now we're having to look at things like how do we recycle things? How do we minimize the waste stream? And we have to do that even for disasters. So we're, we're trying to uh, work through that. The days of just trucking it off and dumping it are uh, further and further behind us. Uh, pets and livestock. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers, there was a very famous photo, or whatever you are, I'm not sure famous is the right word, but there was a photo that came out of Hurricane Katrina do you remember Hurricane Katrina where there was some people getting on a bus and a little boy with a dog and they were not letting him take his dog on the bus and his dog. Well, that sparked a federal law that requires us to incorporate pets into our planning because people aren't, people don't want to leave their pets behind. 
it's probably not a good thing if they leave their pets behind. That creates other issues. So we have to make sure we accommodate that. Uh, and then communications <coughs> planning. Uh, all these different agencies that don't normally work with each other on a day-to-day -day basis, how will they, how will they communicate in an emergency? And I'll highlight that again in a moment. And Harold, before you go on, yes. uh, I have a question from Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Thank you. Harold, remember I used to be the director or chairman or whatever it was for Homer Township. And when we were there, we were working with the fire department and we used to give uh, CPR classes to all the businesses in the community. We put defibrillators all over the place. Uh, we did all kinds of stuff like that. We had fire for life, yellow and that. You remember all the programs? And then when I left, uh, it kind of like, I didn't hear anything about it now. Now it's been probably about uh, six years since uh, the township, you know, we, we kind of like merged, gave everything to the village. And I haven't seen anything. Now, all those programs that we started, are they in existence under the county's jurisdiction now, or are they just dead? Well, some of the things you mentioned are still active programs, like the File for Life program and the Yellow Dot program. Uh, the health department is very active with the Yellow Dot program in particular. We promote File for Life um, through a lot of our public efforts. I can't speak to exactly what Homer Glenn might be doing. Yeah, I don't hear I hear nothing about, we used to do, uh, remember we had all the disaster drills and yeah. all that stuff? There's nothing like that happening anymore. <laughs> And uh, we used to do mock things where everyone had to go to the school. We had volunteers taking names like it was a real disaster. And it don't happen. I just wonder who's doing it. Yeah, it still happens. In fact, i got some other things I'll, I'll highlight in a minute about some of those types of activities. Of course, it's different across the county as far as what a local community does or doesn't do in terms of their preparedness. We work with a lot of the communities, uh, especially when you talk about things like exercises and training to either participate in their exercise or uh, oftentimes we develop exercises and, and conduct them for them. Well, what I was wondering is if, if those programs didn't end and the county took over, or are they just not following through and uh, promoting them like... Yeah, I mean, we're, still, we're still doing them. That really hasn't changed as far as what level we do them. What, what's, what they're doing there, I couldn't speak specifically to. Thanks. Sorry. And Harold, I have another question. Yeah. And I mean, Steve, you bring up a good point as people <coughs> rotate out of positions in different local governments, different activities start taking place, and somebody may follow up on something people might not. Yeah. And that's uh, not really your responsibility. Well, I mean, it's, a, it's kind of a never ending quest to try to keep everybody Keep just, everybody moving. Yeah. Forward. And as you get people that change, uh, that's difficult. And we uh, <coughs> recognize the fact that, especially, you know, local leadership. You're, you know, everybody's busy dealing with the things that are happening today and, and when we talk about things that might happen tomorrow or five years from now, we understand people's uh, time is limited to focusing on this, but of course we try to work with all of our officials to We're in crisis management mode versus, uh, yeah. Uh, but that was my question actually deals with, you know, um, technology has taken on a huge role in our culture. And uh, how are we um, set and how do we coordinate cyber attack kind of activities? Yeah, well, you know what, I'm, if you can hold I that, can hold that question. I'm going to be visiting that in a second. Um, okay. Let me uh, move forward here quickly and I'll come to your question. Um, of course, when, we, when an emergency occurs and we, we shift into a response mode, our, our job as an agency is, is coordinating response. Sometimes that's blurred with the to talk about commanding a response. We usually look at the command of an incident as being the field commanders, the fire chief, the police chief, that type of thing. Our job is a coordinating role, so we're there to try to orchestrate the response among the different players, uh, at a, particularly at the county level, of course. Uh, and of course, we're obviously concerned about protecting lives and uh, property, trying to restore order to a situation. So a lot of the things that you see during emergencies, that's what we're focused on. Um, a couple of things that I'll, I'll touch on in a little part of what you just uh, asked a second ago. Uh, one part of response is how do we bring everybody together? How do we tie all those pieces together? Some avenues that we have to do that, uh, the county has its emergency operations center, a physical location which happens to be in this building and that's also where our day-to-day -day offices are co-located. This provides a, a physical space that's ready to go, that county leadership can come together. And, and coordinate, make sure right hand and left hand are, are on the same page in terms of uh, response. Uh, 
looking at technology and some ways that's changing in, uh, a little bit, is we can also do that in a virtual sense now through the magic of technology. We have a, a software package that uh, is called Web EOC, so as the name implies, it's a web-based emergency management package. It allows us, no matter where we're at, to be able to log in, share information, uh, manage resources, all those types of things that we do in the EOC environment. So whether we're sitting in the same room or not, we have that to help manage all the information that's spinning up during an emergency. I'm sure many of you have seen the, excuse me, the mobile command center. That's something that we can take to the scene. And that allows us to have the, excuse me, the tools so that those field incident commanders can help manage the incident. If you imagine that they're trying to manage hundreds or perhaps thousands of responders out at the scene, this is to try to make their job a little bit easier by providing them with the communications tools, computer equipment, just the space to work from. Uh, and then communications systems, and I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit in a, in a moment. Last part of that cycle that I, I talked about is recovery. So after a, an emergency occurs, we need to recover from that emergency. We generally look at that in terms of short-term, immediate restoration of services, getting the roads open, trying to get the power back on, things of that nature. And then long-term recovery. How are we going to eventually rebuild? Uh, you know, about 30% of businesses that are closed due to a disaster never reopen after a disaster. So what's the economic impact to the community? Things of that nature uh, we have to look at. And then as you can imagine, that cycle sort of begins over again because during recovery, we can look at how we could possibly mitigate for next time. How can we try to minimize the effects next time? This is, of course, is a, a big issue, particularly since September 11. As I said before, it was really on our plate before September 11, but uh, it was a much smaller part of the pie, so to speak. Of course, these days it, it, uh, it calls for a lot more uh, time. And uh, again, we're not the only player in that game. Our sheriff's office, of course, is a big player. They certainly get involved if there was a, a threat. They get involved to try to help uh, uh, deter through patrol and things of that nature. The health department has a big role in the realm of bioterrorism. And then, of course, state and federal has a very big role. Uh, federal Department of Homeland Security, uh, the state level. Uh, we have the uh, Illinois Terrorism Task Force as the state coordinating body, uh, which has about 60 members on it. And I'm, I'm fortunate to be one of the, those members, so I get to sit at the table with a lot of the other players at the state level on what's happening. But as I said before, some of the things we do for one type of threat really have applicability to other types of threats, and the Homeland Security issue is no different. So it's not a matter of having this separate standalone bubble of Homeland Security versus emergency management. They're all pretty interrelated. Getting better prepared for a Homeland Security threat helps us get better prepared for the flood or the tornado and vice versa. So on that Homeland Security, you know, Will County, sorry. Um, in the past, we've been a little shortchanged, I think, from a regional standpoint, um, in that we have, you know, the nuclear plants. I mean, we've seen trillion leaks. We have uh, the mobile refineries and stuff, yet we weren't the ones receiving the cash for the support from the state and federal. Cook County was getting that. Right. So where are we at with that? Now? Yeah, I, I agree with you on the phrase shortchanged. That, that, that is, I, I consider that to be a very good way to sum it up. You know, there, there are a lot of funding programs that, that come from the federal level for Homeland Security, and the two big ones are what's called the State Homeland Security Program. So each state gets funding based on uh, their criteria, population, threats, things of that nature. So each state gets different amounts. And then there's also a program called <coughs> Urban Area Security Initiative, or UAFC. That's funding from the federal level directly to major metropolitan areas. Uh, obviously, we're part of a major metropolitan area here, Chicago metro area. Uh, but to make a very long story short, when the program was established years ago, part of the federal criteria was that the major urban area, Chicago, uh, as well as adjoining counties, well, the only county that adjoins Chicago is Cook, they essentially get to decide who else is in the urban area. Well, as long as it's left entirely up to them, why do they want to include the rest of the metro area? That's the sticking point we've been in for all these years. We've done our best to argue the point, but we're just you know, swimming uphill there. 
And then the state program, in fairness to the state program, obviously they're trying to manage funds across the whole state. So if they started to hand funding individually to jurisdictions, it would not go very far very fast. So a lot of state level initiatives are to help support regional efforts, to help fund training. So we do benefit from those things, but in an indirect way. Uh, we don't see it in the form of a, a big check that comes once a year, but we do see it in the form of training programs that are funded for local responders, uh, exercise costs. There are some regional response capabilities that we can call in if we need them. But So we're sort of caught in the middle of those two programs, unfortunately. Have you been participating at all with uh, our grant writer here in the county and assisting and how has that been going? Because we're going to be having that conversation during the executive today. Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, I mentioned those are the two big programs. There are some other um, more specialty type programs and we, we have been able to benefit from at least one of them. Uh, it's the port security program. So it, it focuses on port areas. Now you think of port areas, you think of Long Beach or Norfolk, but Lake Michigan, our river system, that's also part of that. And we've been able to uh, have some success in, in that program. The, that mobile command center that you saw uh, was largely funded through that program. Uh, the sheriff's office, you've seen some of the SWAT team equipment that they've received over the last few years, which largely came from that program. Uh, both the sheriff's office and our agency recently applied and it was, it, uh, it was through Lois that helped us uh, manage that process because uh, you have to go through the federal process. We, we were just awarded a couple of small port security grants this year. Uh, the sheriff's office received, I think, about a $16,000 allocation, and we received about a $24,000 allocation. Uh, our equipment is for monitoring equipment, so if we have a release from a location, some kind of chemical release or a, a, a WMD-type release, it lets us set up monitoring stations so that we can see what's what's going off into the neighborhood, what's going off into the community. Yeah, like so what happened up in Romeoville, was that a year or two ago? Yeah, just any kind of situation. Sometimes it's to see what is coming, and oftentimes it's just to verify nothing is coming, too, so we can assure people that it's staying on site. So, so yeah, we've had some successes, and, and, and she's been very helpful for us on, 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 on helping us navigate the process. <coughs> you mentioned ports, so I just wonder, do they take into consideration our inland port, the railroad? Yeah, no, it's totally waterway port related. And, so and how would that get changed, or should it be changed? I guess would be like yeah, I don't, that's the question. I probably couldn't couldn't hazard a guess at, at that. Um, I think that just falls into the general state hazard profile, which is what mm -hmm. dictates how much the state gets in the state homeland security program. Uh, I'm not aware of any program that specifically addresses those types of facilities. It's a huge disaster. That's why I asked. Yeah. And that's a that's an issue for us. Um, in fact, I, um, I'll, I'll I'll switch to that. We we deal a lot with hazardous materials. Um, you're all aware, well aware. We have a lot of facilities. Um, of course, there there are the big ones. There's oil refineries and uh, the major chemical plants. We have about 450 facilities in the county that are uh, they're ultimately regulated by federal law, and that's what kind of drives our our planning. Uh, so we. We deal with all those facilities annually. We receive information from these facilities on what they have at their facilities. Some facilities, about 120 or so of those facilities are required to do a deeper level of planning in conjunction with us and in conjunction with local fire department on how we would deal with it if their material left their site and we have to contend with it. But as some of you have just alluded to, um, transportation hazard is also a big one. We have the highway transportation is, of course, busy around here. Um, rail transport, and in particular the last few years, you've heard a lot about the, the crude oil, Bakken crude. Um, they found that that oil from the Bakken region it has a lot of volatility to it. I was actually just down in uh, Atlanta back in May at the invitation of CSX uh, Railroad for, for three days. They had a lot of county emergency uh, managers from along their routes that were there. Uh, so there's a lot of focus on how to deal with those. Uh, you've seen some high profile events that have happened where some of those trains have derailed and they've caught fire. And uh, uh, quite, it's, it's a big issue because quite honestly, probably 90% of the time if we had that type of situation, 
it's very difficult to extinguish those. The, the only way you're really going to deal with them is let them go. Um, and that means we have to sit there and contend with a lot of smoke going off into the area for perhaps days. It could lead to evacuation. But CSX told us in their history of, of crude fires along their rail lines, they've not once been able to successfully extinguish it. The local fire department just doesn't have the resources or it's, it's the location is too remote. It's just a very <coughs> difficult situation. Uh, so there's a lot of attention. US DOT has been paying a lot of attention to the crude oil issue. Um, a lot of planning is starting to happen. Uh, we have relationships that are better with the railroads than they used to be. I, I can remember years ago, hardly the time of day out of the railroads, and now that's very different. They're, they're very much more interested in, in having a dialogue with, with us um, than they used to be when it comes to emergencies. Um, just a quick question on that. Um, we're doing a freight, highway freight study. Are you involved in that at all? Have you been no, we haven't really engaged in that yet. I wonder if that would be something that we would need to, from an emergency management, at least to include that as part of the study. You know, I don't think that the monies under the FAST Act would fall in any category. It's yeah, not really so. for emergency management or preparedness. It's more to address, not that safety, if you will. So and that's kind of what I'm thinking. But, you know, the movement of goods, the ingress and egress from one point to another, uh, the efficiencies of highway and how to move the freight and so forth. But, but I was also thinking of the preparedness aspect of this. You know? I just don't think that the act encompasses that broadly. You know, I mean, these are more grants. They've only awarded, their, it's a five-year program, and they've only awarded the first round, right? You know, and to my knowledge, none of that has gone for an emergency EMA type of No, and I wasn't grant. thinking this is specifically for the EMA. I was thinking it is part of that whole you know, global perspective because when we were taking a look at the free says we can take this offline for the discussion. Um, but it isn't, I mean, we, we are looking at it from a global perspective in the study from workforce impact to see. I mean, Ann Schneider will come back and, I mean, you could reach out to her, certainly, but. Uh, and again, I just, I, it was more of a question than. It's obviously a, you know, big issue here and, and as an emergency issue, it's a, it's a significant issue that we have to continue to watch. Um, whether it's roadway or rail. Uh, the materials are here, Bach and Crude in particular. We've got uh, four different rail lines that, that either deliver it into Will County or it passes through Will County. So it's, it's here. And obviously you know this better than I do. We're, we're in a strategic part of the country where a lot of these you know, transportation routes come through us or come to us. And uh, we can tell that the, the pipelines, all those black lines up there are pipelines <coughs> across the county. Um, That's, what are the red dots? Those are, those are those fixed uh, facilities. Uh, facilities. Uh, the, the pipelines we've got, uh, we're, we are far and away the number one county in the state uh, as far as pipeline mileage. And, uh, this is a never any issue with us. I, I probably don't go more than a, a week or so without talking to at least one of these companies. They're, they're required to reach out to us. They're required to do a lot of planning. And a lot of times that means knocking on our door and, and then we end up uh, having to try to work with them. We, we want to work with them. I don't want to make it sound like we don't, but it's a it's a big work effort on our part. I see it says six facilities. I, I did go through grammar school. I think I can read <laughs> what does that mean? Let me ask them. Yeah, and then I'm referring to the the uh, the oil refineries, the chemical companies, all those ones that it's a fixed point. There's so it's a, that many chemical companies in my neighborhood? There are wow. about four hundred now those range from that can be anything from a Exxon Mobil refinery to a Home Depot store that has chlorine for your pool. Oh, oh okay. So is See, that everything now this between? is why I asked because yeah. that gives me a much better picture of what all those little red dots yeah. are. We've yeah. got a Home Depot, uh, a right. Handy, or a Menards, and yeah. But they're all required to, if they have certain chemicals and like they, they have, have them propane. in certain quantities, it's all based on what the chemical is and how much they have on site. If they meet those thresholds, yeah. and that's where it falls. And then uh, certainly waterway is also an issue that far as traffic that comes through here. And they're all up in my neighborhood. And I'm getting ready to get blown to kingdom come. <laughs> I still remember when Union 76 went off, man. I lived in Bolingbrook. I felt the ground shake. I watched my neighbor's windows break. Yeah. It was a scary feeling. They prevent, absolutely. Just a couple more quick things, and I'll, I know you have other meetings to, to deal with. 
Uh, again, we're not a we're not a response agency on a minute by minute basis, but we do have uh, some special response resources that we're home to. We have what we call our field services group. That's a group that does a, a wide variety of things. They support the sheriff's office a lot on major events. Uh, they uh, help out at uh, incidents where they might be lighting or some assistance with scene control, things of that nature. They, they help us out when we have flooding issues, moving sandbags from point A to point B, that type of thing. And then two very specialized teams. We do have a hazmat response team that works with our local fire departments, helps provide expertise. <coughs> We're very fortunate some of our hazmat members are, are industry people that have day-to-day -day knowledge of hazardous materials that we just don't have that expertise in, in house. And then we also have a search and rescue team that um, helps particularly law enforcement agencies if they have missing individuals. So we're home to a few special teams of that nature. Okay. Um, I mentioned before public education. I know this came up earlier. We do try to devote a lot of effort in the world of uh, public education. We feel like uh, most people can take care of themselves in a disaster if they just make a little bit of preparation. So we, this is one of those deals where we feel like a little bit of preparation ahead of time uh, helps everybody when something happens. So. We uh, participate in a lot of public education activities. We typically, in a, in a typical year, we have direct contact with about 9,000 people a year through anything from a, a public education booth to public education uh, sessions, training sessions, things of that nature. Uh, the van that you see there is a recent acquisition. We actually acquired that uh, through a federal surplus program. That was that used to be a uh, undercover spy van. And mm -hmm. we, we took it the opposite direction. We wanted to stick out like a sore thumb now. It, it used to blend in neighborhoods and, and watch for bad guys. Now it's something that we use to help uh, draw attention to the public education message. And then of course, um, uh, we talked about technology a minute ago. We try to leverage that as much as we can through our website, through Facebook, through social media uh, activities as well. Uh, communications, I think you're all aware that one of the things we also do is we maintain the county's uh, countywide uh, radio system. Uh, three of our, our full-time staff members are devoted to the, the uh, maintenance and management of that. Uh, we have other systems too. We do have some smaller scale systems, one that's along the, the uh, river area. Uh, and then we have some what we call conventional repeaters. These are much simpler systems, uh, but they're systems that we use either for special purposes or as backup uh, systems that we maintain. And then we also have what we call tactical communications. So the things on the left column are, are systems, things, you know, fixed infrastructure at tower sites, but when an emergency occurs, we oftentimes have to deploy what we call tactical communications. Uh, so we have mobile communications, such as the trailer that you see. Uh, that trailer actually came through the state Homeland Security program a few years ago. And it's essentially a tower site on wheels. So the the tower site on the right is a fixed site out in Frankfurt. The one on the left is one that we can move to a site. Uh, it doesn't look like much, but that was about a half million dollar uh, piece of equipment that we received through the program. We have caches of radios, uh, suitcases of portable radios that we can take out to a site. And we're also pretty proud of the fact that we've got, uh, at this point, we have 10 people who are qualified as what we call communications unit leaders. These are people that can figure out the needs of an emergency on the fly and then how to address it. Through, through technology, through processes, they figure out how to make all these people try to talk to each other and communicate better with each other. Um, I think this is the last thing I wanted to touch on here, uh, is alerting and warning systems. These are things that the public is oftentimes familiar with. Um, the emergency alert system, you hear that on the radio or the TV, you know, if this has been an actual emergency, you get those tests. Um, we actually have the authority to originate a message. So if there were a message that we needed to activate the EIS, we can generate that message and put it out to our, our broadcast media. We do that with our local media. So we do that with Comcast Cable. We do that with WJOL. We're sort of in a tough spot here because it, it can be a, a sledgehammer to kill a fly type of thing because we're next to the Chicago media market something that might be happening in one little corner of Will County, we don't want to trip off the entire Chicago media market with the EAS message. So EAS is not something we pull out of the toolbox that often, but we can do it. Another one is the IPAWS, Integrated Public Alert and Warning System. This is relatively new, but probably everybody in this room has a cell phone that they've purchased in the last three years. And whether you realize it or not, your phone is set up to receive what's called wireless emergency alerts. Um, 
Uh, the the uh, tornado that hit Washington, Illinois is a beautiful example of that. That happened during a church service, and there were 20 people's phones all went off at the same time, so they knew something was, was up, and they moved to shelter. Uh, so your phone has that built in, and you're, you're receiving alerts from like the National Weather Service for a tornado warning, but we also have the authority to originate an iPause message if we need to, so we can actually trip that system. Uh, National Weather Service, we work with them on some systems. Outdoor warning sirens, I just want to mention this very quickly. Um, the county doesn't own sirens. Uh, there are about 220 sirens around the county. And most of those are municipally owned and operated. We don't control them. The only exception to that is uh, there are sirens around the nuclear stations that Exelon maintains. We do have the ability to activate those. Uh, we usually defer that responsibility to the community since they might know about it before we do, but we still could activate them. Uh, and then uh, telephone, text messaging, email notification. We have a system through a private vendor that allows residents to sign up for that system. Uh, they can go to our website and find that. And then last, I'll just leave you with this. These are just some things happening right now. Uh, of course, you're familiar with the fact that we're in the process of replacing the countywide radio system that should hopefully be online by about this time next year. <laughs> uh, I want to touch on that second bullet. Um, that's a FEMA program. We applied uh, for it. It's jurisdiction specific. So this is a training program that will only be Will County invitees only. Uh, and it's going to be at their training institute in Maryland. Uh, they pay for all the costs of this. And the focus of that course is going to be on terrorist uh, attack. Uh, that's going to be next April. So we're, we're just getting ready. We're starting to identify the people that we want to bring along with us. That's a four-day program uh, that we're, we're really happy uh, or that course next year, FEMA might run four of them for jurisdictions in the country. We happen to be one of the four that got selected for that. Um, we're working on um, emergency management accreditation. Uh, you might be familiar with like the law enforcement accreditation programs. There's also one for emergency management on, on a nationwide uh, basis. And we're looking to uh, try to dive into that world just to try to push our program up to a higher level. Uh, something that just happened recently, we were, uh, we were contacted by the American Kennel Club. I've talked about pets preparedness before. They have a program where they uh, raise funds and provide uh, trailers to uh, provide the supplies that we need to open a pet shelter. And we were chosen. We're the first county in the state that they, they knocked on our door and said, hey, we, we see what Will County has going for it and uh, that we can support it through storage and so forth. We actually just received it this week. And we're planning to do a little uh, formal ribbon cutting or whatever you want to call it um, later this month. So we'll, we'll, we'll get that invitation. If any of you want to come out to that, uh, we're looking to do that in a few weeks. This month happens to be National Preparedness Month. Uh, we have uh, this every September across the country. So we have a lot of activities going on this month. And then also I mentioned uh, long-term recovery. That's something that hasn't gotten a lot of attention, but is getting more and more. So we're, we're diving into that area. And this is, again, just a snapshot of some things that we have. So I realize that you're coming up on your next meeting, but I appreciate you letting me come and talk to you. Hey, Harold, I want to say thank you for putting that together for us. I know when we talked uh, a couple months back, or when it was, that um, I was just amazed at how much your small <coughs> department does. And then I was able to meet many of the employees who happened to be there that day. And the skill set that these people have is really pretty amazing. and they, kind of just brush it off as, oh, it's no big thing, but it's such an important thing. And um, so because of that little meeting we had, well, it was an hour or whatever you said, um, I felt it was important that we bring it to the Public Health and Safety Committee. And I'm very glad today that Grant Spooner was here so that we have it on live tape so that anyone could um, watch it and understand how much this department works, even though they're small, <coughs> these emergencies only happen rarely, but if we're not prepared, then we're really in trouble. So thank you for putting that together. Jake, you had a question or a comment? I, I do. I have a, a several questions. And I'm just wondering, you know, we have NAPO where we share best practices. Where do you guys go to share best practices, like, for example, with Baton Rouge and the problems that they've experienced recently and they've obviously learned from? Where, where do you go for that information? You know, a lot of that we deal with, uh, First of all, we have, we have a regional group that we have uh, in the Chicago area we call the Metro County Coordinators. And it's, it's Chicago <coughs> Cook and the Five Dollars. We spend a lot of time with them. I actually have a, a meeting with them tomorrow where we uh, 
share ideas, we share problems, we try to resolve problems, sometimes it's good group therapy, it's a lot of things all at once, but it's of all the Chicago area problems. I mentioned the uh, Illinois Terrorism Task Force, so the, um, uh, it was born out of the Homeland Security issue, but again, there's a, a lot of blurring sometimes between where Homeland Security threat ends and other threats begin, so ITTF is a big uh, area for that. We obviously work with the state emergency I'm management sure a lot. There. <laughs> Sometimes I don't either. Uh, so, uh, as a matter of fact, next week is. Uh, yeah. We had an organization, and then four quick questions: School disasters. Does that cover gun issues? When was the last large drill? What happens if we lose internet altogether? And um, you mentioned with the EAS, you mentioned Comcast. Is AT and T cable also included in that? We just have. Or um, TV? So I'll try to remember all those questions. Um, uh, we are we are currently only connected to the Comcast system. EAS in general, on a larger scale, is connected to the other carriers. So we can trip them through the big market, but just the local activation of the system is only Comcast and WJOL and WJCH um, and all the WJOL system stations. Um, what happens if we lose the internet? It's nice to have that mobile command center. And everything, yeah, but we do. Um, uh, we have we do maintain we maintain systems that are very old school. Um, uh, for example, I mentioned earlier communication systems. We still maintain some of our old school stuff that predates the current radio system 20 years ago. Uh, the state has a, has a uh, high tech system that they use all the time, but they still maintain their old school system that we're part of. So we do have what I call old school comms um, and old school capabilities. Uh, there's no doubt that we, we all have come to not just uh, rely on the internet as a luxury, but as a necessity. So, no doubt it would be a difficult day if we didn't have internet capability again. Because I noticed you mentioned it was a web-based system, and I thought, well, if the web goes down, what are you doing? And, well, I'm glad you mentioned that, because that, that system in particular, WebEOC, we actually, um, we host it ourselves, and we, we do host it in a server room here, and also uh, the health department was good enough. So we do have some redundancy there. If we lost internet connectivity, but we were in the building, we'd still be on with VOC, we would lose that internet uh, access to it. And our last large drill, does it cover gun and gun issues? We, um, so I'm trying to think of the last time one that would have been a particular gun and school combined, but just as recently as May, we had a multi-jurisdictional um, active shooter exercise. So we we simulated an attack, like think like San Bernardino. Or Orlando, but think of it happening in three different places, three separate jurisdictions. How we coordinate? So we did we did that very recently. A lot of the schools do those types of drills. Sometimes we're involved in them, sometimes we're not. Of course, sometimes they just do it independently without our involvement in them. Uh, so they're happening all the time. It's definitely on the uh, on the menu alongside fires and bomb threats and tornadoes. So uh, they, they definitely incorporate them. And we'll have one more question from Mark Perry. Just a comment. I'd just like to say on behalf of the people of Plainfield that when emergency services came out and reacted and did everything that they did, you guys did a great job, but we don't want to find out how better you've gotten that. Fair enough. All right. Thanks again, Earl. <coughs> I'm just going to pass this around. I'll leave you with this a little. Yeah, maybe we could get okay. a, um, will we get the link for the, the uh, copies of the will. presentation to the full county board? Yeah. Okay, and for the full county board, it'd be good to know. Thank you very much. Um, move on to other new business. Is there any other new business that anyone would like to discuss? Okay, we will move on to public comment. Uh, we have a public comment in the back. Could you please come up? I'm going to do it from back here, Judy. I just wanted to make a comment that I'm part of the lot for you. Grant, you need to come up to the front okay. so you can. State your name and everything, please. Craig Schooner. I'm part of the Lock Forty of May and Will County Search and Rescue. And uh, I wanted to comment on the Dr. Carroll's training. They do a great job. They train all of the other EMA units around us. And that affects even Will County and Cook County because they have a mutual aid request next week for Fields to Park. Um, but I often wondered. <laughs> if you if you spend a lot of time with Harold, you know that he is a uh, very um, busy person and he is active and I think he doesn't sleep. I don't think he does. So thank you, Harold, for all the work that you and your employees do for us. Appreciate that. Um, I do not have any type of report. Oh, there are any other? Sorry, any other public comments from anybody? Any other public comments? 
Okay, we'll move on to Chairman's report announcements. I have none. Uh, executive session, we have none. I uh, take a motion for adjournment. Motion. Second. Motion by Trainer, second by Ferry. All in favor? Aye. Uh, meetings adjourned. Our Aye. next meeting is October 6th. Thank you.